Bonjour, bonjour tout le monde. Welcome back to We in France. I'm Diane. Thank you for being here. Now, for many of you out there, France is a dream destination, and rightly so. Between its rich history, architecture, there's also an undeniable je ne sais quoi, and I get it, but it can also be a bit confusing. Now, before you pack your beret and learn to say bonjour, I want to make you aware of some very, very normal French things, things that you'll encounter as a tourist, and also if you live here, that might leave you scratching your head and a little confused. Now, here on this channel, on We in France, I love talking about French versus American cultural differences as someone who's lived in France since 2012, and judging from your comments on my channel, you enjoy the topic as well. So we're going to get right into it with six differences between things you find in the U.S. and France that might not only lead to a sense of wonder, but also bewilderment as well. All right, number one, la bise. Now, you might be very familiar with this French cheek kiss greeting. Sometimes we do it in the U.S., but in France, it is normal. It is what you do. Now, if you've spent any time around the French, I know you've seen it. And all it is, la bise, it involves a cheek kiss, one on each side. And that could be kind of a surprising custom, I feel like, to Americans because we normally hug. That's what we do in the U.S. to say hi to friends to family, we hug to say hello. But do not do this in France. They don't hug casually. You're not going to want to be hugging anyone. You go in with a kiss on either side of the cheek instead. That's called faire la bise. It's more like a cheek touch, though. You're not actually... You're not actually like turning your head to make contact with your lips. And this is not just a one-time ritual, like when you meet someone for the first time and that's it. It happens frequently. You'll find that French people use it to say hello. They use it also at the same party to say goodbye in social situations. And there are some unspoken rules to learn. It is common amongst friends and family and sometimes acquaintances, definitely in social settings and sometimes in more informal work environments as well. Now, you'll normally see la bise shared between uh, two women or a woman and a man. Usually men prefer a handshake over la bise, except sometimes among uh, close friends or family. Like my husband has a twin brother, his dad, they do la bise. Now, also something to watch out for is some regions in France, you'll find that they do more than two cheek kisses. So instead of just one and one, they might do one, 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 one. And I've actually never encountered it where I live in the Mene Loire, but different parts of France have different expectations. So you'll have to tell me if you've expected two cheek kisses and someone goes in for more than two, if it caught you off guard. I'd love to hear about that below. I've made a lot of faux pas myself. Speaking of that, I'm personally, I'm not a fan of la bise. I just, I moved to France in my 20s. I find them a little tedious. I'm used to hugging. I did a whole video on them. And as someone who wears glasses, I feel like sometimes you can clank someone else's glasses, you know, if both people are wearing glasses. And then some people are crazy aggressive with their, their kissing style, like... No offense to my father-in-law, but he'll come in and I kind of instinctively recoil when I see him coming because it's like a really hard smack on the side of the cheekbone. And also there was a guy at the gym that I was friendly with and you say hi to your friends. So when you see me, he come over and, you know, you always have to do la bise. And we were both already sweaty. You know, there's no AC at the gym and I would always get like a nice sweaty cheek imprint from him on the side of my face from a sweat, but I mean, there are worse things, right? I personally, I'd rather do a hug to say hi, you know, not like a big intimate press your body against someone, but you know, the one-armed hug, that's just what I'm used to, right? But when in Rome and all, you adapt, you learn. All right, number two, the bread bag or the bread drawer. Now, Americans love bread, but the French, I feel like they take it to an entirely new level with bakeries seemingly on every corner, you know, from a nice tartine for breakfast, a sandwich for lunch, a fresh baguette with cheese after your meal. Bread is everywhere in France. This is not a stereotype. And it is absolutely delicious. Even a bad bakery in France is still probably better than probably a pretty good one in the US. I mean, you tell me, but it's good. It's good stuff in France. Bread is not just a food, it's a sacred object, it's a part of pretty much every meal. And all that said, the way the French store their precious commodity, bread, it caught me by surprise. So you're going to want to forget plastic bags. The French have a dedicated space in their kitchen in which they store bread. So a bread drawer, a bread bag. And I even have one in my kitchen where I live here. I had asked my husband Tom what it was when we first moved in because I had no clue. I pulled the drawer out, there was like a canvas bag in there, and I'm like, hmm. What's this for? It looks kind of nice. And there's a story I think I told you before. It's a major faux pas I made at a friend's house years ago. It's actually quite hilarious in retrospect. Let me tell you the story just in case I'm mixing up where I told it. But anyway, I was at a friend's house years ago with his family. I was getting ready upstairs, as you do, in the bathroom. 
and there was no trash can in the bathroom. So I had like used Q-tips on cotton rounds, done my makeup. So when I was done getting ready, you know, I put everything in my hand, my Q-tips and, and all of that, my tissue, cotton round, put it in my hand. I was going to bring it down to the trash can in the kitchen to, to get rid of my things, right? I didn't want to leave it in the bathroom. So I went into the kitchen. Breakfast wasn't ready yet. I get up early. No one was in there. I opened up a drawer in the kitchen that looked like a garbage bag to me. There was like a canvas bag in there and then like a plastic bag in there. When I looked in the bottom, there was like, I don't know, like crusts of bread. Like it looked like trash, right? So I just didn't think anything of it. And I threw my used tissues and threw my used tissues and threw my used tissues and, and Q-tips in there. And then about like half an hour later at breakfast, my friend's dad went to get something out of the garbage, right? That drawer that I put all my trash in. And he's like, he pulls out my stuff. He's like dangling my tissue. He's like, what is this doing in here? Who put a tissue in? What is this? And I was like, I think my face turned like 10 shades of red. I was horrified. I admitted it was me. I said, I thought that was the trash. There was nothing upstairs. I, I needed to throw my things away. And I learned that lesson, that thing in French people's kitchen, everyone, this is a PSA, that thing that might look like a trash can in a French person's kitchen is not a trash can. It is a bread bag. Now, I've learned my lesson, but some people actually have like a canvas bag behind their door. Um, it's not an actual drawer that pulls out. It's not something like mine that's built into the cabinetry. But just be aware of this and don't make the same mistake that I did. If there's any question about what the trash can is, just ask. Because if you assume that it's that drawer that pulls out that looks like a trash can, that might not be it. Now, you might be wondering, why do you need a drawer? Why do you need a bread bag? Like, we don't have them in the U.S., and the thing is, bread needs to breathe. There's often leftover bread and plastic traps moisture, and that'll lead to a soggy, kind of a sad, not fresh baguette. So the French solution is genius. They have a cool, dry drawer or bag that keeps their baguettes and other types of bread fresh and crispy for a little bit longer. And I have a recommendation, while this is not a bread bag for your kitchen, if you want a really nice, high-quality Paris tote bag for bread or for anything, uh, use it at home, use it in France. It's from a store called French Address that's run by a French woman named Mathilde. So if you want to support a French small business, check them out via my link below. But it's a really nice bag. I can vouch for the brand. All right, number three, house shutters, or in French, they are called les volets. Now, if you drive through a French town at night, you're going to notice that all houses and apartments have window shutters that cover their windows. Now, some are manual wooden ones that you actually have to open by hand, reaching out the window and opening them and closing them. Others are metal roller shutters that have, you know, they have a rod on the inside that you lower from the inside of your house. But regardless, these shutters, they're a cultural must-have. They are for privacy, security, and temperature control. And pretty much everywhere in France, you'll find them, the north, the south, and other countries in Europe as well. Now, you keep them closed in the heat of summer. And if you choose to do this, it also means you'll be sitting in the dark. And that way, the cool air from the morning, it stays inside. Remember, AC is not the norm everywhere in France. And also at night, you're going to close those volets. Now, I personally like waking up to natural light and not sleeping in pitch black darkness. So Tom and I compromise on our bedroom shutters. We don't close them all the way. Now to contrast that with the U.S., shutters are often solely decorative, just kind of adding to a home's look, to its curb appeal. And they generally aren't used for function, except in maybe hurricane prone areas like Florida, where my family lives. I feel that Americans, they depend more on blinds for privacy. Triple pane glass is really common and central AC and heating. And that way, you know, Americans were not opening and closing shutters daily. It's just a little bit different. Now, something else which might seem a little odd to an American visiting France is that certain websites are blocked when you try to access them outside of your home country due to data protection laws. And that can be a major inconvenience. It happens to me pretty frequently. Has it happened to you? Or maybe you get these slightly creepy targeted ads when you browse the web. But I want you to forget all that because I have a solution. Now, to help keep your web browsing experience safe and stress-free, let me introduce you to today's sponsor, NordVPN. They are linked down below, and I would love for you to check them out via my link. Their virtual private network helps you stay safe online, whether you're home, or abroad, especially when using public Wi-Fi. You'll be protected from malware and hackers. Your data will stay private and your online activity won't be tracked. NordVPN basically tells the internet to mind its own business and you can browse the web without having to worry about prying eyes, annoying geo restrictions, or that creepy feeling of being constantly watched when you're on the web. You can think of it as a fence for the internet that keeps you safe by encrypting your internet traffic and protecting your online identity. 
Just download the app, it looks like this, and you can browse safely and privately with the fastest VPN on the planet. Now, one account will protect up to 10 devices, you can protect the whole family, and NordVPN offers 24-7 customer support and a 30-day money-back guarantee. To start browsing safely now, risk-free, grab my exclusive NordVPN deal, four months free, on a two-year plan via my link below. Thank you to NordVPN, and back to the video. All right, number four, tanning pills. Now, this is something I had never seen before I came to France, but you'll find that French folks, they stock up on tanning pills like the brand, I believe you say it, Onobiol, before they jet off on summer vacation. Now, these are not popular at all in the U.S., and these types of pills, they fly out the shelves in French pharmacies, especially during the summer months. You'll just find them on the stands at pharmacies, and they're very mainstream. Now, they're vitamin-based pills. They help prep your skin for long days on the beach, in the sun, and they're meant to be taken before your trip, during your trip, and after that summer vacation. And not all of them actually change your skin's color. They're not self-tanners, although there are self-tanners in France and a few formulations that I think were even more popular years ago. They did contain beta-carotene, or I think a dye called canthaxanthin, canthaxanthin, something like that. And they do apparently help boost the appearance of your tan naturally. But there's different types, right? But as an American, I feel like the concept of taking a tanning pill, like ingesting something is kind of strange, but you know, they are super popular with French people. And I do want to mention there are those formulations that do work on changing your skin's color with like curcuma and other, other pigments, but the FDA I actually looked it up to see if the FDA said anything and they say steer clear. So because of that, like I just never had a need. I personally stay out of the sun. I've never tried these pills, but they are popular, even though you'll never catch me sunbathing the whole family history of cancer thing. And the fact that I am white as a sheet or a wall. Just sun and me don't mix. But you will see uh, French tanning pills and you'll have to let me know if you've used them, if you like them, I'm curious. All right, number five, cars that don't require a license to drive. And they are called les voitures sans permis, a car literally without a permit. When I first moved to France, this was also something that surprised me. You would see these small cars on the road that make a bit of noise, they look a little different, and they don't require a license. And as I said, they're called des voitures sans permis, BSP for short. And if you're over 14, you can buy one, or your parents can, and you drive it on the road with the rest of us. No formal license required. The caveat is if you're born after 1988, you do have to do some training. But if you're like 60 years old, you can go buy one of these, get behind the wheel. They don't go very fast. You're not going to be racing down the, the autoroute with these at 45 kilometers an hour. But still, right? And they have a reputation for being for people who either can't manage to pass their driving test for teenagers under 18 who aren't old enough yet to have a normal license and need to get to and from a place and for people who maybe have lost their license for whatever reason with the big stereotype being that it's from alcohol related offenses i personally think these cars are a little strange they're not cheap by the way i mean they're cheaper than a regular car but they'll still cost you like over ten thousand euros and if you don't have a license and you haven't learned how to drive, it's kind of scary thinking people on the road could be driving with everyone else without a license because still at 45 kilometers an hour, if someone hits you, that's still, that still has the potential to do damage. But you'll see them. They exist. Be aware. All right. Number six, my favorite. It is the French speech noises. And there are all kinds of sounds in the French language that do not exist in English, but I'm not talking about the French air or the U sound. I'm talking about the sometimes jarring, at least at first when you're not used to them, speech noises that you'll hear out of French people's mouths, and now actually mine too, once you get accustomed to them. And they act as fillers and exclamations. And if you're curious about what I'm talking about here, I have a humorous blog post that I did years ago on the strange French noises with audio clips that Tom helped me record. I think you'll love it. I hope you check it out. I'll link that blog post below. And finally, something I always point out is that cultural differences, they're not inherently good or bad. They're just neutral. They're just differences in most cases. And I feel like when we look at these cultural norms through our own lens, through our own life experiences, our own culture, in my case, American, we can perceive something to be strange or weird. And it's all part of just adapting and learning. And I think it's fun to joke around, but when it comes down to it, honestly, there's just differences. We're not better or worse than anywhere else. And I think it's really important to not place judgment on them. You know, no one's better off than anyone else. Like, we're all people. We're just doing the best we can. And I personally, I love learning how things are done elsewhere. And it's been a journey for me in France. But I hope you like learning about this stuff too. And I want to thank NordVPN again for sponsoring this video, for the collaboration. Thank you. Thank you to you for watching and your support here on We in France. I'll see you right back here on the channel soon. Salut.